Okay, I think we are back on. Um, I apologize for that. Let me just make sure and see that everybody is here. Hold on. Um, did you guys all get an alert? Yeah, think about it Thursdays, powered by Restream. All right, we're on. Um, as um, I said, Rabbi Lutz, we're just waiting on Rabbi Lutz, who's finishing a meeting. Um, uh, let's see. All right, let's see where he is. Um, we're gonna talk and get to know Rabbi Lutz a little bit more if you don't know him very well. Um, and also do some trivia about um, a subject that is very close, near and dear to his heart, which is aerospace engineering. And I um, have been doing some research because I don't know anything about it. Um, so I have uh, been doing uh, a little bit of uh, educating myself about space and aerospace engineering. Hello, Temple Emanuel like Beverly that. Hills. Uh -oh. My all right, let's see if we got a live thing on, um, if we're live on the Emmanuel channel. Hold on, it's a little difficult to find. Let's see, if you're here, say hi. Hi, Marta. All right, some people are finding it. I can't even find us, but I found you. Good morning, Marta. And there's a couple other people on Facebook. Marta, did you get a, oh, there it is. It's on yes, YouTube. But I found you. Okay. Good morning, Marta. All right. There we go. Now I can feel confident that we're on. Um, so what is new these days with everyone? What are you looking forward to? Is there gonna be any pivot in your summer um, plans, I'm wondering? Um, I personally am going to um, Lake Arrowhead for my Institute of Jewish Spirituality retreat a week from Sunday. Um, it's all virtual. But my sister, who's in the program with me, is um, is also coming with me so that we can do our virtually. It's a, almost it's a hybrid of a silent retreat, um, and so I'm very much looking forward to that, to spending time with her and to be out um, in the woods. Hold on, Rabbi Lutz is having trouble getting in here. Let's see if he gets in. Um, I know less about any of this. All right, Judy Aronson, I'm reading your, your thing. I see Karen, I see Marta. I'll be staying home. Yes, well, um, well, Marta, we are in, going to be in a VRBO, <laughs> but maybe there are some things that you can put into place to make it feel like summer. All right, he's here. Sorry. <laughs> It's okay. We are live, I believe, on Facebook and YouTube once Ooh, I, um, and you should be able to log into that little restream. Um, yep. Let, me, I let, me, let, me, let me do that. Yes. So we can chat with everyone. Well, almost yes. everyone. Yes, we're still, um, you know, we are not the type of people that settle with um, just regular technology. So we keep working on- For better or for worse. <laughs> for better or for worse. It might keep us up at night. But um, we are now using this restream platform so that we can reach more people. So um, we have a bunch of people on Facebook. Great. And um, I told people that I've been educating myself about space. So um, uh -oh. you're gonna are you going to know more than me now? I might know more than you, whatever Dr. Google has taught me. <laughs> um, and, and for people who are logged in right now, let us know if perhaps um, you have some weird space facts. We're not just going to do space. We're going to talk about um, Rabbi Lutz and his, um, like, I don't know, maybe he like um, dreams about space. Maybe we'll talk about your dreams. Oh boy. <laughs> it's going to be like a therapy session. <laughs> Good morning, Jay. I see you on, on um, YouTube. I'm sorry. I, I went live and said that it was Bim Bomb Shabbat because I used to rename it on Restream. So then I stopped it. It's, it's usually when we're on together, it's Bim Bomb Shabbat. Yeah. I know. Well, restream, you would think it would give you a little thing that says rename this, but it, it didn't. Does, it does on the OBS version of restream. Oh, well, yes. I have to learn OBS. Good morning, sis. Okay. I kind of feel like I have to take a deep breath. <sighs> the breath gets harder. 
the, the breathing gets harder. Um, okay, so Rabbi Adam Lutz, you are going into your fourth year here at Temple. Yeah, Temple? fourth year. Yeah. Wow, time flies. I know. Um, I like, by the way, when people come up to me and they think I'm 23. Um, I just, this is just like a funny fact. They think I'm 23 and I'm like, yeah, I like graduated college, went to five years of seminary, have worked here for six years, but I'm definitely 23. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what people tell, that's what people tell me too. And then I tell her lift, listing off the degrees and they're like, how old are you? Uh oh, your, your sound just went on um, like all echoey. That was weird. I don't know. Maybe it came back. Uh oh, hang on. Yeah. And see, it's like a, it's like you're in a stadium now. Yes, okay. I just turned on OBS. Oh, that's why. Okay. Dor hi, Dorothy Sulkin. Oh, hi, I'm Sharon. Sharon says, what is OBS? That is an online broadcasting system. Is that what it sounds, stands for? I think it's, uh, what does it stand for? OBS. Studio. Essentially, um, it's a platform that allows you to broadcast from home. and to Open broadcaster software. Oh, I like mine. Uh, oh, what did I say? Something broadcasting. Online system. broadcasting. Online. System? That makes sense for yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds actually. It sounds like a network or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I, that, that's my online broadcasting yeah. system. It's um, so cool it's that a, I can see everybody. It's a, of, it's a piece of software that um that I use. I don't know, you know that anyone else uses it at, at a manual, but other people use it across the board. It's um it's like the number one streaming platform or or piece of software. Um, that we can use to do all sorts of fun things. It's actually what you see me using when I do Torah study on Saturday. Um, it's how like, you know, in some images I get my head sort of in the in the corner of the screen um, with a nice background. It's how when we do Bim Bam Shabbat, um, Cantor Weiss and I are like able to like be right next to each other. Uh, it's, it's a very cool uh, little piece of software. <laughs> Everybody likes my uh, definition more. <laughs> Online broadcasting. You should, you should go to OBS. You should send them a ticket. And say, yeah. hey, we think you should change your name. Cantor Weiss from Temple Manual <laughs> Beverly Hills um, suggests online, online broadcasting. broadcasting system. You guys should change it. <laughs> yeah, but um, no, there. this has been such a learning curve for everybody. And um, the amount of phone calls, I think specifically Rabbi Letts and I have received from clergy and Jewish professionals around the country about how do you do this? And how do you do that? And how do you... I mean, I should get paid a consulting fee for the amount of phone calls that I, I'm sure both of us have received. And people want to know everything from like, what microphone do you use to how do you know how to do this? And I would say Raymond Zachary from the dentist chair. Um, I just want to say, how do we know how to do this? I will repeat my answer because we're not afraid to figure it out and to Google it. Half the stuff we do, you'll see Adam and I in a meeting like, Googling, like, how do I do this? <laughs> right. 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 It's, it's actually, um, I, I talk about this, um, with my brother, who's just learning how to, how to, how to program and how to code software. Um, it's so interesting. Like you have to learn, you learn like the basic, like tools of like how to, how to try things out, how to troubleshoot things. But then Google has like the answers for everything. I mean, it's the power of, it's the power of the online community actually in a really beautiful way, which yeah. is that like people have already learned and have been doing this. Like streaming is not a new thing, right? Like um, I, I've been using this Let's example. Let's do a trivia. Where has streaming and the OBS software <laughs> been probably most developed over the last 15 years? Th there you go. What's the answer? You know, uh, uh, yeah, video game, video game streamers, and I've been I've been talking about this since COVID started. Is that like we need to be looking at places that do this really well? Um, we we do this funny thing in the Jewish world where we only we look we look inward. We're like, well, what's the Jewish thing that does this thing that we're trying to do? Like, what's the Jewish database system or what's the Jewish accounting system? Like, there aren't you know, the rest of the world doesn't exist and there aren't actually accounting systems and database systems and streaming like approaches that actually are proven to work. Like we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Right. So by the way, Restream Bot, which we have to figure out how to rename, is um, you guys are actually, if you're on YouTube, you're seeing what people are also writing on Facebook. Um, so for example, where is one that came through? I don't know. Um, when Marta, I think first wrote, and well, that says Facebook, uh, 
Why, where is it coming up as Restream Bot? Let's see. So, so where it comes up is is actually in um uh, on YouTube. Oh, on YouTube, yeah. When it when it what it does is it's pushing it pushes the um people's comments from Facebook over to YouTube. Unfortunately, YouTube or Facebook doesn't permit it to go the other direction. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately on Facebook, you only see Facebook, but on YouTube, you actually can see people on Facebook and YouTube. And it's like, you're having a conversation across platform. Yeah. So, so right now on YouTube, um, like uh, Marta, see how it says Facebook Marta Waller because failure is not an option or from Helene Cohen, good morning. She actually wrote that on Facebook and you're seeing it on YouTube. So now everybody can like see all the people who are watching and instead of just the people on YouTube or just the people on, on Facebook games are the first place where tech first is pushed forward, says Sharon, like video games, Sharon, is that what you're talking about? Well, so it's interesting. And actually this is very appropriate video games and space travel, right? Space travel. The fact that we have oh. to, you know, I right, like you know, that kind of transition. I did not plan that. Um, <laughs> all right. But like part of, part of the bummer of having our space program in the United States really defunded for the last almost decade is that, um, you know, when we need to, when the human race needs to push itself to do something new, by the way, COVID is an interesting experience, is an interesting example of this. We're having to push ourselves to operate in ways we wouldn't normally operate, just like operating in zero gravity or in space isn't normally uh, an, a normal operating way that we experience in the world. Um, it pushes us to develop and to create. Um, and so much of like what we know about today in technology was actually built in the 60s when we were trying to get to the moon. Um, so it's, it's a really, you know, and, and actually when you think about the technology too, like the technology on the spacecraft that got us to the moon, the, the phones in our pockets are like way more powerful than, than that spaceship at this point. Um, so it's just, it's just interesting to- Wow, to that's say, crazy. Is it is. <laughs> okay, so Rabbi Let's give us a 60 second, because we've all heard your, your I don't wanna call it a spiel because I don't wanna undermine it. By the way, um, I always like to ask like, what coffee cup are you using? Do you have one? Uh, with I don't have a coffee. My coffee was uh, consumed at about six this morning because Ruby <laughs> woke up. So I'm I'm on to spin drift at this point. Okay, I'm I'm I have a Broadway a fun a, a fact about Candle Lizzie Weiss is that I tend to collect um, not collect but like I like to get coffee cups because then when you drink it yeah. reminds you of that experience. I even have a Black Lives Matter cup because it's a good reminder every day yeah. and because the proceeds go to a good cause. Your coffee cups are more political than mine. We do the same thing. Um, well, we, mine's usually Broadway shows. <laughs> so we collect, we collect Starbucks. We collect Starbucks cups from the places that we go. So you know how they have the special cup? I have a friend who does that. Yeah, so we have like Starbucks cups from like everywhere that we've been the last like six years. Yeah, they're cool. Um, uh, okay, so this is a great transition because Sharon Baumgold says, I'm a huge proponent of space exploration. And also High Village took a tour of JPL about a year ago. I remember hearing about that. That's really awesome. I have to say, I never got that like space camp experience. But Rabbi Lutz, give us, first of all, your 60 second. What did you want to be when you were a kid? What did you end up being and how you became a rabbi? Oh, boy. Six okay. seconds to do all that? Okay. I think you could do it. All right. So when I was a really, really, really little kid, I wanted to be, um, like when I was three, I wanted to be um, a firefighter. Um, I did. I know. But I didn't want to be like a firefighter, firefighter, because I knew they had to go into the burning buildings and I was a cautious little <laughs> child. So I wanted to be the chef at the fire station because I didn't think that they had to go in to fight that fires themselves, but then I could still be a firefighter. So that was, that was stage one. <laughs> So like stage one was, I want to be a chef at a fire station. That's correct. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. And that doesn't, I, as, I, as I only know from my deep experience watching Chicago Fire, don't they rotate? Like, don't the... Yeah, but a three-year-old doesn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, that's hysterical. <laughs> that was stage one. Then okay. stage two was I got really into trains. So I wanted to be a train engineer. Um, so I suppose that was the beginning of my engineering days. Okay. Uh, and then... Then I was always really good at math and science. Like I finished our my high school math um, in 11th grade. Like I had taken AP Calc, AB, BC, AP Stats all by 11th grade. And then in 12th grade, I was on to college math and I was taking um, college classes at like Moore Park Community College and CSUN, um, which was great because then I got to transfer those to, to UC San Diego, which is where I went for undergrad. Um, and it was a natural transition to, to engineering. Um, because I, and I had to decide, I remember I was deciding between mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering. Um, and I decided on aerospace because like 
planes and rockets are way cooler than than cars. Um, so, so I you went. Know, and- I've heard that engineering as a whole is like the most high pressure major you can go into. It is near impossible to finish it in four years. Um, I did have to do summer classes one summer to finish it, but it's it's crazy because the majority of the classes are are you know I was taking anywhere between four and seven classes a quarter um, to be able to finish, and they're none of them are that easy. Like I definitely didn't get straight A's in college. (laughs) (laughs) Um, it it also just as like a side fact, my, as you know, my nephew Abraham is, he just majored in physics and he's doing a one year addition to get his master's in physics, um, through this crazy program that he's a part of. And what he explained to me when I was trying to figure out, he's very into, Hi, Patty. Hey, <laughs> um, Patty. Patty. <laughs> Pat, my, Camp- childhood, my childhood canter. Yes, childhood canter and um, a beloved colleague. Um, when I asked my nephew, Abraham, um, who maybe will be able to be a, um, a guest here because he's coming to visit. But um, when I asked him what the difference between an engineer and a physicist was, because he could have done either side of it, he he kind of, I think he explained to me that a Physicist is um, on the larger side of um, figuring problem solving, right? Or asking the questions, whereas an engineer is figuring out how to answer the questions. Does that make sense? Yeah. (laughs) Engineering is more like applied physics. I mean, obviously physicists do like tests and things like that. They're, They're really involved in really pushing, you know, theoretical physics. Like how does the universe work? Um, and then test, testing it, theorizing it, and seeing if that's true or not. Um, and engineering is more about sort of the, okay, well, what's the practical piece of this that we actually need to incorporate into our lives? Like, you know, how do you put a plane in the air? What do you do when a plane gets damaged? Like, how do you fix a damaged plane and not compromise its structural integrity? That's primarily what I worked on when I was working on F-18s. Right, like those right, are- all right, so let's get so let's get there. But which, by the way, the last project that I asked my nephew what he was working on was he he was working at an internship in Florida for one of the largest uh, w- uh, water and power companies, and they're actually he he always thought he would go into nonprofit because he has a very high ethical sense of. But they are one of the top leaders in in helping climate change, and so one of his projects was figuring out the exact place for a solar power paint. So solar power power panel to go in like Antarctica. At what angle is it a split one? That's what he was working on based on statistics. So people are doing some crazy stuff out there. You know, it's it's not a fluke when you just see at the top of Taft High School when you see all of their um, you know solar panels. It's just amazing. Yeah, it's all it's all very intentionally designed and planned. And and Cantor Weiss, you could attest to this, and everyone else who knows anything about me knows that like. I am intentional to a fault many times, um, <laughs> where and a planner to a fault in many ways too. Um, but oh, like, you froze with your mouth open. <laughs> oh no, that's not. <laughs> you're okay now. Um, yes, Rabbi Lutz and I are very. It's interesting. Our goals are the same. Our executions are very different. I'm kind of like a. This is my vision. Let's figure out how to get it done. And he's like, "This is my journey. We'll see what happens in the end." <laughs> um, so there, there's pros and cons to that, and we work together on that. All right. So you ended up majoring in your actual major was in what? Aerospace engineering. Aerospace engineering, and then what happened? So then I um, I got a job working for the Navy. I worked at um, a North Island Naval Base on Coronado. Um, I really couldn't have asked for a better spot in the world to to get a job. Um, and I worked there for three years and about halfway, and actually while I was doing that, I, um, I got a master's in, in, um, in engineering specifically in advanced structural materials. So like the master's is actually, yeah. Uh, it's Wait, a really- while you were working at the Navy, you got another master's in advanced. I got, I got my first, my first master's oh, in first advanced master's. structural materials. Um, I specialize in what's called a composite material. Um, which is what I worked on on F-18s. Composite materials are like uh, anyone who plays tennis or golf um, or drives a Corvette 
um, like, you know, the graphite, the woven graphite, that's a composite material. And in other words, like a composite material is a material made up of many different materials. Like a tree is actually a composite material. Our bones and our bodies are composite materials. Wait, so you got a major in this in composite master's, materials? Master's. I have a master's oh, in advanced and advanced structural composites or advanced structural materials when I specialize in composites. Crazy. So, right. It's all about like how do materials work, which is really important as an engineer. Like you need to know how materials work because if I'm going to choose to build something out of steel versus titanium versus aluminum versus a bunch of materials sort of smushed together like a sandwich, um, I need to know how they work. Um, and what's very cool about this, at least I thought it was very, I still think it's very cool. I'm going to geek out here for a minute. In composite, <laughs> in composite materials, um, unlike steel, right? If you, if you have a piece of steel, it has the same strength in all directions. What's really cool about composite materials is you actually can design the strength in any direction, which means that if you know where the strength needs to be, I can design a material that's way more lightweight because I don't need to now have all the extra material in the directions where I don't need it to be strong. So um, you actually learn how to, I mean, you're figuring out like on a computer how to create it, but you are, are you actually making the materials as a part of your Yeah. So, so we had, we had, we worked with artisans in our shop. So I, as okay. the engineer would design, I would not only design the material, but I would design the process by which the material needed to be made. And by the way, you bake these things in like these gigantic ovens that go up to like thousands of degrees on like, you know, huge amounts of pressure. Um, but the artisans would put them together um, and they, they were very skilled um, at, at, at building these things that I would design. And these are like engineering artisans. Does that make sense? Like, is there a, like a specific major just for people who do that? A lot of these guys are, I don't know. It, it's very much like a mechanic shop. When you walk down, you go to the shop, but they're like, they're way higher level than, than like your car mechanic, right? They, right. they have to... You're, imagine you have like a really thin piece of paper. That's essentially what a composite material is. It's a very thin piece of graphite that has woven fibers in it. And you have to orient the fibers in a particular direction. And actually the, the angle matters. So they have to be very fine with their, their own motor skills and, and their dexterity to be able to put these things together. And then they have to follow the process exactly correct in order to produce a material that has the correct strength. Otherwise, you have to redo it. Okay. So this was so interesting that you were like, I'm going to become a rabbi instead. <laughs> so I, I really liked my job. I actually really liked being an engineer. I never didn't like it. I love the people that I work with. I actually was where I learned that like the people you work with are, is like the most important piece of any job, yeah. um, which is why I love working at Temple Emmanuel. Um, but basically in, in just a couple sentences, I, I would come home and I would be like, is this, is this it? Is this what I'm doing with my life? I'm going to do this. Like, and it just wasn't fulfilling. I wanted to do something that, um, where I could feel, I could feel like I could be my whole self, not just like as an intellectual person, but like an emotional person and a spiritual person. And when I thought about the moments in my life where all three of those things were true, that I could be intellectual and spiritual and emotional. They were all Jewish moments. It was my bar mitzvah. I was going to camp. I was an AE pie in college. And then I was like, wait, this is what I love to do. Why don't I just spend my life doing that? Let's also note that your dad is a rabbi. Which is, right? why, I, which is why I didn't want to be a rabbi. Right. For a lot of us, that, that happens. But I, I, I think uh, it would be interesting to get the statistics on how many clergy come from lines of whether it's aunts or uncles or um, parents who were clergy, because I do think that um, that having influences that are often your family is the biggest thing that makes you become clergy. Because otherwise, you just it's a very unknown career in so many ways. Okay, first of all, Marta, you win funny prize. I thought learning to fold a fitted sheet. <laughs> For the record, there's few things in life. Not I shouldn't say few things. There's many things in life that I'm not good at, and folding a fitted sheet is one of those. It's just. I'm going to say that I'm too short. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, All right. my, it's my job in my house to do that. Ugh, yeah. I just, I, I don't know if it's just that I, I have a lot of um, patience for technology. I do not have a lot of patience for like things you do with your hands in the house. <laughs> so anyway. Um, all right. So I do, I did look up some facts, but so then you went to rabbinical school and the rest is history. There was, there was a brief, there was a brief, um, uh, exploration between engineering and rabbinical school where I thought about going to culinary school. Oh, um, 
And you worked at, tell everybody. I, I did work at Spago for one day um, <laughs> to sort of try it out. I cooked for the uh, Academy Award after party that HBO was having at Spago um, in the in the pastry kitchen, um, and it was fun. Um, but then I talked to a lot of chefs, and they told me how their hours were, um, and I was like, "Well, I want a family. I don't really want to be working at three in the morning." Um, so, like the most successful chefs are getting up to do the shopping themselves sometimes. At yeah, like the the family work balance as a chef. Like we think it's bad as clergy. I think. I, I, chef has got to be the worst. <laughs> yeah, you can't bring your kid into the kitchen and. No, so it's so it's a hobby of mine. So there's something I get to do. Like I bake bread, I bake challah. Like it's fun. Like uh, you know, you've seen yeah. my Instagram. I have seen your Instagram. I don't know if I've, everyone else has, but you could go find check it. out. My, go check out my Instagram. I think I'm. I think I'm a less. A less thirty three. I actually just sent it to someone this morning for Genesis. Um. All right, but actually, before we get to the funny facts that I found, actually, I don't know that they're funny, but, um, you know, when Rabbi Lutz, uh, came in, I mean, we each had different experiences growing up in the Jewish in the Jewish world, and even though they're life has really changed. Um, even since we were kids, uh, I, you know, I remember feeling overprogrammed as an eight year old and that doesn't even apparently like match up at all to what kids are doing today. And I think it's really, really hard because I'm really, I felt very lucky to grow up in a household where I was just given opportunity to explore without an expectation of you're taking voice lessons. So that means this is what you are going to be in life. My parents really, um, with triplets and with two older siblings were like, reach for the stars and see what happens. And, um, the biggest lesson that they would teach me is use your, your God, your God given and built skills to make money. For example, like I was into tech tech, I was kind of like a techie in high school. And so I was then able to, in college, have a job for $30 an hour doing sound for the church that rented out my old high school auditorium, like things like that, where I had friends who were working for $6 an hour at a grocery store. Um, so if, I wanted to say that's one big thing. But um, when Rabbi Lutz started working with me, I had started to try and work on a concept of a conservatory and then we realized between our two sides with his science and space and math background and my performing arts background that we really wanted to think about the kind of kids that we want to grow <laughs> at Temple Emanuel and the kind of nurturing that we want to um, do uh, do and my one line and then I'll kind of turn it over to Adam I'd, I'd love to hear your your, your line too. But my one line is like, you're not, you're not just Jewish, uh, you know, on Friday night or at Sundays at Hebrew school, but how can we integrate Judaism into the skills that you discover at a very young age? So therefore we started to create Genesis. Do you remember the first name we came up with? The first name before Genesis? J it wasn't that different. It was, it was J steam, wasn't it? We had J steam, which is Jewish, Jewish uh, team. Science, science, technology, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Yeah. Right. But then we called it generate and we were like really into that for a while. And then all of a sudden somebody, Alex, Alex so Kaufman, he used to work, said Genesis. And we were like, yes, like the beginning of everything. So we love it. And it has been a labor of love and very difficult. And, um, well, so so it's, it's so interesting, right? And and this actually, it's, this is an interesting thing to to talk about. I think um, the and and before I even I even go there, I think I think the important thing for me, of course, like you know, everyone's going to get sort of inside Rabbi Letts's brain right now, <laughs> um, which is a scary place to be sometimes. But it's like for me as as a as a rabbi and an educator, I'm like, how did I how did my journey work? Like, how did I get to this place where Judaism became such an important part of my life? And and I think it was always that Judaism for me was was a foundation was foundational. It was like the the foundation upon which I could build the house of my life. It supported me. It was the structure. It actually connected all of the different identities that I have. Like I'm a musician. I am an engineer. I'm a I'm a chef. Right. Like and then how do all that? How, where how do I combine all of those things? And for me, it was always Judaism that allowed me to bring all of those pieces of me together. So then if I'm, if I'm reverse engineering what education looks like in education, the question is always, what's your end goal? What are your, what are you trying to get to? How do you know that the kids have learned what you want them to learn? So then of course, then the question is, okay, well say a kid has been successful 
and gone through Jewish education and they become an adult, obviously their Jewish learning will continue, but what's the skill or the tool that they should learn in order to say, okay, that was a successful education. And for me, the tool has been, how do I use Judaism in my real life? If I'm going to grow up to be an artist or a lawyer or an engineer or a doctor, how do I understand that through a Jewish lens? And how then does that Jewish lens give me meaning, additional meaning to, to whatever it is that I'm doing? So that's what we want to teach the kids. But in order to do that, we have to start with what they care about. I don't know that many kids, at least in our world, they don't come in being like, tell me the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're like, why am I here on Sunday mornings? I really would like to be playing soccer, or I'd really, I'd really like to be doing violin lessons, or I'd like to be building robotics, or I'd like to be acting and singing and dancing. But of course, all of those things, they're not, none of them are Jewish per se, but like we can teach them through a Jewish lens. There's all sorts of delicious Jewishness that we can incorporate. And by the way, if we as Jewish leaders, I'm totally on my soapbox right now. If we, okay. as, Jewish, if we as Jewish leaders want to show that Judaism is relevant in the 21st century, it cannot live on its own in some isolated box. It has to be able to incorporate into, into life. Otherwise, what's the point? Okay. And what I would say this, I'm gonna put you on the spot with this question. Um, why should people care that what they that that their violin or their robotics is infused with the Jewish lens. I mean, listen, they don't necessarily need to care, but for me, it's about weaving the identities together, right? These kids don't have one identity. They're not just violin. It's why STEAM education is so interesting. It's because like we used to think left brain and right brain were bifurcated. It was like, okay, you're either artsy or you're techie. But you hear about me telling my story about what I had to do as an engineer. I had to design and create every single day that I was in it, that I was working as an engineer, I had to come up with outside the box ideas. That's right. right. That's all right brain, right? We know, I think we know that actually most of these kids today, and we, we have some data around this in Genesis is when I sent out a survey and I said, basically like, would your kids like to do theater or art? I mean, a theater and art or, or robotics and, and, and like computers. And most said both, right? So right. kids have both of these identities. So then the question is, how do you, weave these identities together. And for me, Judaism does that. Judaism is that thing that allows us to um, have a whole neshama, um, a whole like, you know, sense of being and soul to, to bring all of these disparate pieces of ourselves together. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think there's so much um, just ch the change in, in careers for people. I mean, it, the same thing that you said, like with like people could think that I'm just kind of a uh, an emotional kind of singer person, right? But like Adam knows that maybe five percent of my job, you know, I'm trying to give myself more time, but it's spent on that artistic side, and the majority of it is spent on the logistics and technology to be able to express my artistic side in the most fluid way. Um, that's an interesting thing. Um, also, with with Rabbi Aaron, who who Edi, uh, who edits film um, is that when we've interviewed a lot of people around the country or they've asked us, well, who does your liturgy PowerPoints and who does your videos? And we're like, we do right. like we literally do all of it um, right. because for me, if I write a Hashki Venu song, I want to also be a part of how it gets put out into the world. Um, and that's been a major change. Uh, um, I know definitely with Rabbi Letts and I coming in is we don't just um, create a program and then turn it over to somebody and say, can you do all the marketing for this program? Or, I mean, we don't necessarily have that, that type of um, staff to be able to do that. But also, you're never going to get the same message out as if one that you create yourself. So whether it's an email or whether it's a video, whether it's the doodle videos that Rabbi Letts has created for Genesis, if you guys have seen those where it looks like someone's writing, um, my biggest message for kids is like to be as holistic, authentic of, of a person. And, and by the way, I just want to say one last thing before I start quizzing Rabbi Letts, which is that every person is different. Um, Rabbi Bassin, who is doing really well with her new baby, um, she has like a whole other set of amazing skills and, and it's technology is not necessarily her thing. Although she's, she actually edited some pride videos and she's doing really well, 
but she will um, pick up the phone and say to us, like, how can I help with this or that? And I think that's the those, that's the kind of person that we're trying to create is, you know, maybe um, website design is not my skill and I'm of a developed enough person to call and say, can I do extra phone calls to congregants just to help you? So um, I think that's why we all feel really blessed to be a part of the Temple Emmanuel team because we all are developed creatures who recognize our flaws and, and also what we have to offer. Um, thank you, Patty. Your congregation is blessed in so many ways. We appreciate it. All right, Rabbi Lutz, here we go. Oh, boy. Uh, here's the problem. Sometimes I don't even know what to Google. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you last time, like, what should, all right, so. It's, I, an, important, it's an important skill set, actually, to learn how to search. It's a really I know, a very important I know. tool. <laughs> I've gotten much better at, at, you know, you can, when you Google, like, strangest facts in the world, there's the same six websites that come up and now I'm on week like 10 of this. So I can't do that anymore. Oh boy. <laughs> but I, what I did think was the first, I'm going to start kind of macro and then bring it in. So a 747, what is a 747? Tell everybody. It's a Boeing airplane. Okay. Do you know how many parts, um, and we can do some trivia. How many parts does a 747 have? Don't let, let's see if anybody writes in. But Everybody can take what, some. Guess. What are we counting as a part? Like, are we going down to nuts and bolts here? We are going down to, yes, yeah, screws and bolts, literally. What about what about composite materials? Or are we including all the materials oh, and no. composite materials? Um, it includes screws, bolts, fasteners. So I would assume so. Yes. Actually, now I don't know sounds, when you're talking sounds about. Like, a sounds like not actually. Oh, really? <laughs> well, like I don't know. They would consider I'll, it as one piece. I'll read you the fact in a second, but like, are you saying like if it's a composite material made of three things, does that count as one or three? Right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think it's, I think they're counting it as three. Uh, let's see, is anybody guessing? Nobody's guessing yet. All right, well, let's, let's see your first, your first guess, Rabbi Letts. It's gotta be in the billions would be my guess billions i i mean if you're counting every nut i'm trying to think so on an fa okay so maybe so in that case it's still a very high number but i think you're right let me think on an f-18 you had on just the wing on each wing you had let's see there was 1500 you had like uh, 3000 it was something like it was something like probably close to 10,000 fasteners on just the wings okay okay so maybe not in the billions um take one more guess and we have one guest coming in. I don't know. A uh, hundred million. Oh, okay. So Marta says about six million. I had to know this answer when I was at KTLA. How how fish <laughs> was an airplane person? And actually, you're you're basically right, Marta. A seven forty seven has more than six million parts. It says a typical car has 30,000 parts, including the screw screws and bolts. But if you think that's a lot, you'll probably be surprised to learn that a 747 400 passenger airliner has a jaw drip dropping 6 million parts. Of those 6 million, about half consist of fasteners. It's not surprising. What is a fastener? Like a nut and a bolt. Like a nut and a bolt. Okay. All right, Marta, you win. You know, Marta, well done, Marta. You have to come on and be a guest because- uh, you know, you have a really interesting past. I think it would be interesting for you to come on and, and present, I should say. Okay. Um, according to Engineering by Stanzion Kadon All in 1989, this, the term aerospace engineering first appeared. Do you know when that, that, that title was given? Like that category? What, in what year? Aerospace engineering? I don't know, in the 50s? Yep, 1958. Uh, Makes sense. It was a compound word borrowing the word aerospace, which refers to combination of the Earth's atmospheres and outer space. In that same year, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, was founded. Oh, is that how you knew? <laughs> I, I didn't. Okay. I, I didn't know that they were that there was a relationship. But I was just, you know, thinking about when when space became like a big a big thing and that was in the 50s do you think that aerospace engineering professionals are high in demand I, I think so i mean i mean look at what's going on with with elon musk and spacex i mean there's yeah. 
you know, an amazing amount of opportunity there. Um, Do you want to go to space, by the way? Would you be one of those civilians who would see, look, you're too scared. I hate roller coasters. It's like, it's like you with the fire, with the, the fire station. Wanting to exactly. Be the yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm cautious. I've, I've always been, just ask Emma, I'm cautious. Wait, do you not, I like, I don't really like roller coasters either. Do you really not like roller coasters? I, I don't like the drops on the, Me too. I don't, yeah, I don't like the feeling of your stomach in your mouth. Yes. Um, so, like I, I, like, I like going fast. I like going on in like, in like circles. Yes. So like, I, I go on every ride at Disneyland except for Splash Mountain. Me too. <laughs> we just discovered and, this. And Tower of Terror. Those are the two I won't go on. <laughs> Wait, that's so true. Like, I love the Thunder Mountain Railroad. I love yeah. Space Mountain. Yeah. But yeah. Splash Mountain, like, no. why does anybody like that feeling? I, I don't know. And then you get soaking wet. And who wants to walk around Disneyland soaking wet? Oh, so were you that kid who also was like, oh, I don't want to get my hands wet? I don't know. I don't, getting wet, I don't care about that. It's just the yeah. drop. I don't like, like, I, I hate Six Flags. Six Flags is ugh. I never go there. Six Flags is ugh. Yeah. Um, I actually went on California Screaming, which I think they renamed. It's at Disney. At, at, Ooh, yeah, it's turning in. Um, they did it's incredible. Incredicoaster. Incredicoaster. Well, I actually went on that a couple times and I tried. I went with my, when my nephew was young because he just loves roller coasters it's weird how like my nephew who's now turning 14 he was afraid of a lot of things but for some reason roller coasters were like an adrenaline rush to him uh dorothy says i can't even go on a ferris wheel and i get dizzy on merry go round and fast fast elevators are the oh, word yeah uh-huh uh-huh Ooh. okay like the one um, that you to the top of the empire state building uh yeah that's that's a lot but but I do think it's interesting about roller coasters because there must be like a gene. Like, I, I really wonder if there's a gene for like who likes roller coasters and who doesn't. I know that sounds weird, but like, why? Why do some people like that feeling and some people don't? To me, it's like spicy food. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, why do some people, I can't do spicy food. I can hardly do a Tic Tac. And then there's people who like love that feeling of like, and I'm like, doesn't your tongue hurt? And you're like, no, it's just, we should, ask, we should ask a psychologist. My guess is it's in a psychology somewhere. Really? You think it's okay. Um, by the way, this one's like a weird one. Number The number five of six facts is aerospace engineers need a bachelor's degree. Yeah. Doesn't that seem obvious? Yeah. It says like other professionals, however, aerospace engineering requires, requires schooling. Typically, aerospace engineers need a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering. With that said, however, some universities offer a space-focused engineering classes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you have to know how the world works in order to like build things in it. <laughs> I know. That, that was a weird fact for a, for a website that only lists six. Okay. Now... <laughs> Okay, uh, I have to. I'm on. I'm on a new site now that has 46 facts. Um, so, in 2017, that some of this is like how about how many kids are really interested in becoming um, astronauts? So, I actually, when I was doing this research, I was wondering. So, you never wanted to be an astronaut? No. No. I think being in in space would be really cool. I'd like to be in space if I could remove the. Uh, the getting strapping yourself to a bomb and going at like you know eight G's. Strapping yourself to a bomb. By that's the way, what, um, think about it. That's what a rocket. That's what it's. That's what it is. Yeah. It's a gigantic bomb. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's crazy. Um, Sharon says engineers don't need master's degrees. No, no, no you so don't. What happens? You get you get your bachelor's and then you go into like trade schooling. Is no, no, you don't, there's no, the, the, what's interesting about an engineering degree is the trade school piece is built into it. So you actually come out with a very practical skill set um, and way of thinking that then you apply whenever, wherever you get to wherever you're going. And then master, and people who get masters in engineering, like any master's degree, it's about a specialty. So you're, you're, uh -huh. you're doubling down on, on whatever thing you want to specialize in. In my case, it was materials because I worked on materials. Oh, Marta, one of the great sadnesses of my life is that I'm too old to qualify to go into space. You never know. She says, I'd love that ride. Marta, do you like roller coasters? I'm just wondering. And en engineering degree equals bachelor's of science uh -huh. equals job ready. Okay, that's that's interesting. And I think that also comes down to like 
the type of person who can get through your bachelor's of science, bachelor of science or an engineering degree. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to work backwards in 1978. Um, there were 8,000 applications to join NASA's first astronaut class, okay? In Marta, I've flown in an F-16, loved every second. That is so cool. Robbie left, never want to do it, but. I actually, I actually probably would. I don't know. Would I go in, when I get into a fighter jet? Oh, I might just for this, just to say that I, I had flown in one. I have here. I'm, I'll show you. I was, I just downloaded this. I have a picture of me sitting in F-18. Um, By the and, way, Marta, you're giving us more reason to want to interview you on Think About It Thursday. I gotta, hang on. Let me flip. I got to turn on my, my other camera. So I'm, you're going to okay. lose me for just a hot second. Uh, okay. He's, he's going to show us a picture. Yeah. Judy, I saw your comment, Rabbi rolling his eyes. Uh-oh, I don't know what that was about. It was about, it was about engineers needing a degree. Oh. <laughs> like, obviously. <laughs> um, hang on, I have like way too much stuff open on my computer. Here, let's keep uh, talking while I do this. Okay, I'll, keep, I'll do this, this fact. So in 2012, no, in 2017, how many people applied to join NASA's astronaut class in 2017? What was the number before? Well, in, 2000, in 1978, it was 8,000. In so in 2017, how many people do you think applied? It's not necessarily correlated, but. Um, 100,000. No, it's actually much lower, 18,000. That's so interesting. So, but however, they only allow in, um, the, the selection process for NASA takes 18 months and thousands of applications received. How many individuals will get the opportunity to actually become an astronaut? Does anybody know? Like in, out of the, out of that number or? Yeah, I think it's, it's out of that number of that 18,000 that apply. How many ultimately are able to follow through? Five. Yeah, it's eight to fourteen. Yeah, it's still low. Um, Dorothy says, listening to this enlightening discussion, now I understand why I got a BS in kindergarten, primary education, and a master in social. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I got a B, a BA in theater. <laughs> uh, Judy says, four generations of structural engineers in my family. I have none of those genes, <laughs> but you are also an educator, Judy. So there you go. Um, you guessed ten, Sharon. Yeah, it's eight to fourteen actually become an astronaut. Um, but once selected applicants are still not considered full astronauts. They face two years of basic training where they're then considered, um, astronaut candidates. One more fact before you share. Oh, should I turn it off? No, no, it's okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Good. Talk about that. So this is, um, this is me in an F-18. Um, this is the last week that I was working for the Navy. Um, this is what I worked on. I worked on these planes. Um, they set up a, a special, uh, that's awesome. You know, visit for me to actually go sit in one that's put together. Usually when I was, when I was in or on them, they were taken apart in some capacity. So this one was on the flight line, um, just ready to be tested after it had gone through a bunch of repairs. Um, and it was fun. It's actually funny when you get, when you sit in them, um, there are all these like, do not pull, uh, like <laughs> cords, um, yeah. because, um, the roof, the canopy, and the and the seat, everything is is um, got rockets on it because when you hit the eject button, they're actually it's all rocket powered. So if you pull any of them, an explosion would go off. Um, and there actually were stories of people accidentally like grabbing one with their foot or something like that, and then you know they're they're working on it, and then of course that's very dangerous because then you get your head hit on something or it's not it's not a great situation. Um, but this was fun. I got to I got to sit in uh, in, in the really cool. version of, of this plane. I don't know. You might, you might need to get that hair back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. It was way, way short. I didn't have a beard then either. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you, uh, this is like a weird thing. Like in your daily work, do, is this like a, like a, you'd have to wear a, a button up and slacks? Are you in like work? Like, no, because, because we were, because we went into the shop all the time and we were climbing on airplanes and getting on the floor and things like that. It was basically like jeans and a polo. Okay. Fun fact, what do yeah. you wear? <laughs> only, um, only, okay. Only conferences and stuff like that, would you get dressed up? What is the one, right, what is the one language that all astronauts are required to speak? You mean like, like verbal language? Yep. English? Apparently Russian. Interesting. 
It says astronauts spent hours learning to read and speak Russian. Spoken fluency is necessary for safety reasons and passing a competency uh, test is required for NASA. Well, it's because they've been flying. Now they're, now they're almost flying exclusively on Russian rockets. Wow. So Russia really did win the space contest. Um, uh, we're not done. This is, we're not done yet. Donna had to wear work boots at her first engineering um, we had we had steel toed boots that we would wear when we would go into the shops. And this is in Coronado, right? On Coronado, yeah. The Maybe north the north end of Coronado Island is is uh, is a navy base. Um, do you know what a vomit comet is? <laughs> you know what a vomit comet is? Yes. Yeah, you want to explain? What zero is? gravity simulation. You go up really really high in an airplane, and then the airplane goes nose dive down to simulate, yeah. basically you reach terminal velocity on the inside, which for people is about 120 miles an hour, um, yes. where like if you were to jump off a building and you, you had enough time to pick up speed, you hit what's called terminal velocity, which is when the air resistance matches, um, it, you can no longer beat air resistance. You can only, you hit a maximum speed, it's about 120 miles an hour as a, as a human being. Um, but so you're going basically that speed down and then you're, you're floating in the airplane. Oh man, that's like, no, thank you. Um, if you look up, I'm on fast, fat, factinate.com. If anybody wants to look these up, world 45 world facts about astronauts. Um, I'm not an astronaut. I know, I know that's, but, but it's interesting to you, right? <laughs> of course. Um, astronauts can be quite clumsy when they return from a long stay on the international space system. They have reported dropping objects like pens and keys because they're not used to holding things in zero gravity. True. And their have muscles, you ever done a zero muscles, gravity? Their muscles that, like, atrophy a little bit too. I have never done a zero gravity simulator. Would you want to? Uh, like the ones like that you like go in and there's like the wind and they like push you up and things like that. Yeah, sure. Why not? Oh, by the way, that's a good step. I, what's it called? Air? Like they had a universal city walk like where you could go in. And, but that one's like air pushing you up. It's not really a. But it's the same idea, right? The physics are exactly the same. It's 120 miles an hour of wind. I mean, this is what's so interesting about physics. Yeah. Um, and partly of what, uh, what what's actually interesting to me about theology too um, and philosophy is, is when you study the equations of physics, there are very few equations actually in physics um, that, that govern, you know, general, general, um, the way the world generally works. When you get into like cosmology and, and quantum, like you get into other crazy spaces, but like, there's like really not that many formulae. And then what's also interesting about it is that um, they, they are very similar across the different branches of physics. So like electricity and magnetism formulas are kind of similar to fluid flow and fluid dynamics formulas, which are similar kind of to like uh, Newton's laws and things like, like the, the structures of the formulas are very similar, um, even though they are talking about different parts of the world and, the, and how the universe works. And then what gets so interesting, this is, this is the piece that I find so interesting and many physicists do, is I'm that so the laws, I will. The laws, the laws that govern, the laws that govern gigantic bodies like, uh, like uh, galaxies and planets. Mm -hmm. If you apply those laws to the things that are very tiny, like atoms and and like quantum physics, they don't work. This is one of the big challenges that physicists are trying to solve, which is, you know, that unified one, that one version, that one unified equation that can explain everything. Right. That's where you get into these like weird. Um, not, they're called non-logical theories, like string theory and like multiple dimensions and things like that. Um, oh, yeah, yo, who's with us right now? <laughs> but right, it's I think right. We ask. It's about asking and, and searching for the same questions, which is like, why are we here? What's our purpose? How does everything work? Which is the same business that re that religion is involved in, although religion doesn't look at it from say the physical aspect. We look at it from the emotional and the spiritual. So, but we need to mesh all of those things, right? You can't ignore what we learn in science when you're talking about theology because right. then you're living in a world that is not cohesive. Exactly. And yeah. Okay. So I have three more facts before we end that are just like silly, but in, but things we might not have thought about. For example, <laughs> the title of this is windshield wipers are a thing, <laughs> which is sneezing in a spacesuit is a delicate matter. <laughs> Who would have ever thought about this? Yeah, like what happens if you sneeze 
uh-huh. and you have like a shield over your face. That's an important question. It says astronauts have to learn to lean their heads forward and sneeze into their chest to prevent it from splattering all over their visor. Interesting. You know, you know, they're thinking about what knob to pull and then also where to sneeze. Like there's a lot to think about up there. That is how, yeah. Um, another thing I never knew is Apparently, when you have gravity helping you, you have have to pee usually when your bladder is about a third full. But when you're in space, gravity is not is is not giving you that sensation. So people, the astronauts are actually trained to go to the bathroom every two hours, no matter what. <laughs> that is so interesting. Here, actually, another here's a fun fact about gravity too. So, okay. um, I this this blew my mind when I learned this. So, um. Right. When we talk about space, we're talking about um, we're talking about the space. You've heard the space time continuum. Right. So if you imagine the way space works is it's like a gigantic blanket sort of spread out. And the way gravity works is it's about the size of a mass in that space time continuum. So imagine dropping a bowling ball on a quilt that's taut. Right. What does it do? It depresses. Right. It compresses and it makes a big well. Yes. That's called a gravity well. So actually, that's why gravity is different in, on different planets, because it's about the mass of the planet and how much space that planet takes in space time. So actually, what we're all doing right now is we're falling. We're falling yes. into that gravity well. And the only thing that's preventing us from going into that hole in the space time continuum is the planet. Um, and that's how gravity works. I think it's really and interesting. That's why, like, there's so many people who will, com- you know, talk about God versus um you know, science. And for me, like, I truly believe in there that, that the only way that this uh, concept, right, about like different types of gravity on different planets and the fact that we can be sitting or standing here today without feeling gravity, to me, is only something that some sort of God or energy could have created. So I'm not saying that science isn't real. It is. I just think it came from uh, God and then science and then <laughs> as opposed to science. So everybody has different um, but that's just my take. Um, I'm going to do one, two, two more facts. Number one, you are, can't eat like crumbly bread because in, in space because it'll it, um, damage stuff. Just a funny fact. And the last one, and this doesn't have to do with, this is not on my sheet that I was doing, but did you know that pilots and co-pilots on like big flights, like we're talking about, you know, big international flights, that the pilot and the assistant pilot have to eat two different meals in case of food poisoning, just an interesting fact. Uh-huh. You never thought, think about that. I mean, I think that's uh, that's that's an interesting it's, it's fact. It's very important, right? You don't want them both to get food poisoning. That would be bad for everyone else. Yes. So Rabbi Lutz, thank you so much. I mean, I think me. we could have talked for another hour and we'll do this for again sure. maybe in the fall. For and sure. thank you everybody who participated. You can also share the YouTube link or share the Facebook link. And um, now we have, I don't know, about 10 Think About Thursdays to enjoy. So thank you, Rabbi Lutz. I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone. Bye.